of the broadcasters and journalists organizations. In 2007, he was presented with the Ohio Radio and Television Hall of Fame Living Legacy Award, an, an honor which goes to one person each year that is a member of the Hall of Fame. In 2004, he left television but continues to travel and contributes a column each month in the Cleveland Plain Dealer. He has even authored seven books about travel in Ohio. The latest book is his memoir entitled Tales from the Road, highlighting his career and some behind the scenes stories about radio and television. He also writes a weekly internet blog entitled One Tank Trips. I am pleased to present to you our guest speaker, Mr. Neil Zerker. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by thanking the Memorial Committee Chairperson Linda Biscup and her committee for inviting me to be a part of this special ceremony on this very memorable day. It's truly an honor to be here. If ever there was a demonstration of bravery and a commitment displayed daily by our police and fire departments, it was on this date 10 years ago. While thousands of victims and onlookers ran the other way, literally hundreds of safety forces ran forward into what they had to know or certainly suspected was probably certain death. The events of that day in New York City, Washington, D.C., and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, are ingrained on our hearts and minds forever. It also changed the way we live and put in question some of the liberties that we've always taken for granted. Yet the uncommon valor displayed by those police, fire, and emergency forces that day is the very same bravery we see every day in towns, villages, and communities across our country. Police, fire, and emergency workers who put personal safety aside to help people they do not even know. It's altogether fitting and proper that we set aside this time on this day in Wellington to dedicate this memorial to the Wellington Safety Forces members who gave their very lives in service to this community. Carved in stone are the names like Royland M. Paul, Assistant Fire Chief George Foster, Al Buzz Anderson, Edmund G. Smith, and Marshal George Brenner. To paraphrase a quote by former President Ronald Reagan, some people wonder all their lives if they have made a difference. Police and firemen don't have that problem. Some of their stories are still fresh. The emotions are still very raw, while others are fading into the cobwebs of history. This is a day to take another look at some of their stories. Sometimes in our lives we see trouble coming from a distance. I'm certain that firefighter Al Buzz Anderson, married, the father of four, saw trouble coming when he responded to a 9-11 call of a teen driver who had ignored a road close sign and drove around the sign and into a flooded highway in Wellington Township on June 22, 2006. The rising waters from a nearby stream swamped the teen's car, trapping him in the swirling currents. He and another teen passenger abandoned the car and climbed into some trees above the flood. An experienced diver, Anderson, hooked a safety rope around his body and waded into the deep flooded areas to recover the youngsters. He carried a small portable boat, but the force of the water was too strong, forcing him back to dry land. A call went out for a larger boat. Anderson realized the waters were getting higher, and so he waded back in to make a second attempt to reach the two teens. The waters were quickly rising, and the currents were very strong, too strong even for the well-trained Anderson. In his desperate efforts to reach the trapped teens, he was overcome by the power of the flood and was sucked under the water. By the time his fellow firefighters were able to frantically drag Buzz from the flooded area, he was unconscious. They rushed him to the hospital. Sadly, all efforts to save him were too late, and he was pronounced dead. Meanwhile, rescuers using a larger boat finally reached the careless teenagers and brought them to safety. But the teen driver's irresponsible act had cost Buzz, and Buzz Anderson his life. The very first Wellington member of the safety forces to be killed in the line of duty was Town Marshal George Brenner. It was late on the night of July 17th, back in 1883, when Brenner, walking the streets on night patrol, came across two men in an alley behind the Union block. The men had just completed burglarizing the nearby office of the Western and Lake Erie Railroad when confronted by Brenner. One of the men had a gun. Several shots rang out. And Brenner was hit in the neck, the bullet tracking down into his chest. He died a short time after the shooting. 
A manhunt of the town turned up one burglary suspect trying to hide the gun in the livery stable. He was 29-year-old John Young, and he told authorities that the actual shooter was 19-year-old August Terry of Terre Haute, Indiana, who, following the shooting, had fled the town. They alerted nearby communities by telegraph. Railroad employees and the Oberlin City Marshal found Terry hiding in a boxcar over in Kipton, Ohio. Both Terry and Young were sentenced to prison, Terry for life. He died two years later when he set fire to his prison bed and succumbed to burns. Early in my career as a journalist, I worked at WEOL in Illyria. At midnight, when my shift was completed, I used to drive to the county jail in Illyria and ride along with sheriff's deputies as they went on patrol. I wanted to learn more about what really happens in the early morning hours when officers patrol lonely streets and country roads. I learned very quickly that one of the more dangerous calls that police had to respond to were those involving domestic disturbances. They were dangerous because these were the situations that could suddenly turn very violent when you least expected it. That was true of Wellington Patrolman Ed Smith. Ed was a World War II veteran who saw service in both Europe and the South Pacific. Married and father of two girls, he decided to become a police officer. In 1955, he took a job as police chief in Waitman. It was a one-man department. He was the only member. One-man departments were fairly common in small towns in those days. The chief had to be tough and smart. He had no one to back him up in a bar fight or a domestic dispute. When his badge and force didn't work, he had to rely on his knowledge of people to talk his way into a peaceful settlement of the issue. Being the only policeman in town is also a lot of work. You're on call 24-7. So Ed Smith decided he needed more time to spend with his family, and so he applied to the Wellington Police Department and was appointed a patrolman on March 4th, 1957. On the day after his 39th birthday, March 4th, 1957, just one day short of two months since he had joined the Wellington PD, he was on patrol when he was called to a disturbance at 300 Cortland Avenue. A 40-year-old ex-con, Walter Byaman from Cleveland, had been dating a 22-year-old woman who lived in the house. She had broken off their relationship, and Byaman, who had arrived at the ex-girlfriend's house uninvited, was arguing with friends and relatives of the woman who had called police when Byaman refused to leave. As the argument raged on, Byaman told the group he was going to his car to get a gun. He was just getting out of his auto with a pistol tucked in his waistband of his truck or trousers when Officer Smith pulled up. Seeing the policeman, Byaman jumped back into his car and started to speed off. Learning the man had a gun, Officer Smith gave pursuit. The chase lasted a little over a mile and ended when Byaman made a turn from Barker Street onto Maple. Maple was a dead-end street. Although no one witnessed the start of the confrontation, it's believed that seeing he was trapped, Byaman, with his gun in hand, leaped out of his car and fired at Officer Smith, emptying his gun at the policeman, who was just getting out of his cruiser. Smith returned the fire, but he had been hit three times, and he collapsed to the ground. Ed Smith, who was still conscious, tried to crawl back into his cruiser, presumably to reach his radio and call for help. Byaman, his gun now empty, ran to the police cruiser, and with no bullets left in his pistol, used it to beat Officer Smith around the head as he pulled him back out of the car and onto the ground. He struck him so hard that he bent the trigger guard on the pistol, jamming the gun. With Officer Smith barely conscious, Byaman grabbed the policeman's pistol, then ran back to his own car and sped off, leaving Patrolman Smith bleeding on the ground. Two men, Edward Auble and Luster Easterline, were working nearby and had witnessed the last of the shootout and ran to assist Smith. Although critically wounded, had struggled to pull himself upright again. They asked if he'd gotten the license number of Byaman's car, and he managed to say no before he collapsed onto the seat of his cruiser and died. But this time, other police from around Lorraine County were approaching with sirens wailing. Byaman didn't get very far. On West Road, he tried to take a sharp curve too fast. His tire blew, and he careened across a ditch and slammed into a utility pole guy wire. As deputies arrived, Byaman leaped out of his car and fired one shot, but his gun jammed. He threw up his hands, and it was over. Byaman was found guilty of first-degree murder on July 3rd of 1959. Trembling and praying, he became one of the last persons executed in the Ohio electric chair. Walter Byaman lies in an unmarked grave in Columbus, while Officer Edmund Smith's name 
inscribed with honor on the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. Where do we get such men as these? These were the words of General Paul X. Kelly, Commandant of the Marine Corps, on the arrival home of the bodies of 283 Marines killed in a terrorist attack in Beirut, Lebanon in 1983. He said, where do we get such men? Where do we get such men of courage, such men of dedication, such men of patriotism, such men of pride? Well, the simple answer is we get them from every clime and place, and from every race, every creed, and from every color. I would like to add to that thought that we also get such men of courage from Wellington, Ohio, men like Ed Smith, Buzz Anderson, George Brenner, and the other names on this new memorial. May God bless each one of them. Remember, to live on in the memory and hearts of those we live behind is not to die. Thank you, Mr. Zerker.